Thank you very much for coming tonight and thank you uh, in helping me organize this symposium. Mr. Hinema uh, is an uh, art philosopher and he's also a cognitive philosopher. And uh, he's also doing research uh, in the art faculty of the university. And uh, his research is about investigating the capabilities of artifacts, media, and art, um, especially art, uh, to expand and enhance the human cognition. So, do you have the floor? Thank you. Okay, well, as Stephanie said, I'm a philosopher, and I'm a philosopher of art. My talk will be about exactly the same uh, subject as you heard in the speech before me, but I will take a very, very, very different angle. And for that reason, I will have to explain some things in the beginning. It's called, what the belief are we looking at? Um, I should make clear from the beginning that I am very positive about science. Uh, I call myself a neuroskeptic, but that doesn't mean that I don't believe in science. I even think that over time science makes progress and lots of progress. So this uh, talk should not give you the impression that I doubt all science. Uh, I even believe that the humanities make progress. Um, I don't think that the humanities are in the same state as they were in the, in, in the times of Aristotle or Descartes. Endeavors, scientific endeavors of people make progress. What I do believe is that nowadays there is a difficult well, relationship between religion and science. And this is just to show you that I'm absolutely not a relativist. Uh, I think that religion can be quite wrong, uh, uh, and science can be quite right. Sometimes, when it comes to scientific matters, it might be the other way, but it almost never is. So I am someone who, if you wish, believes in science. That's my starting point. And still, I am a neuroskeptic. And I will try to, uh, to explain to you why. What I will try to argue is that we don't know what we are looking at. We have not the faintest idea. You might have got the impression, the, the brief is 20 minutes, that we know what we are looking at and that we know what we are doing and that we know, that we know what we are researching, but I will try to show you that it is absolutely not the case. We have not the faintest idea what we are doing. Um, Let's begin with this problem. This is just an old philosophical problem, but as far as I'm concerned, it is the most important problem when it comes to looking at brains. It is this. Um, I call it the cold purple problem. Suppose you see something purple. Well, what's the problem? We all know uh, pictures like this, the, the, the light rays fall onto the retina, blah, 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 visual cortex, boom. <laughs> yeah? The problem with this has always been the question, where does the color purple come up? Is there a place in the brain where we suddenly realize, wait, that's purple? Is there a part of the brain becoming purple when we look at purple things? Well, we all know that's not true. We all know that the brain stays the color it has. So, where does this color purple reside? Well, this is really the tricky question. And what we do nowadays is say, well, this is a question, we'll solve this. But this is a difficult question. Where does this color purple come up? René Descartes, uh, 17th century, uh, realized that this was a difficult philosophical problem. 
Descartes uh, uh, knew it was a problem because he cut into the brains of animals that we know for sure. Probably he cut into the he cut into the brain of uh, people as well. And what he said was, well, yes, you can cut the brain, but you can never see the mind. You can never see experiences. You can never see uh, the color purple in the brain. So where should it be? And he came up with a solution. And I'll show you this solution because everybody scoffs at this solution, but I think it's a great solution. Descartes said, humans are, uh, are two things. They are a body and a mind. The body he called the race extensa, and it's all the, the body is all that takes in space. So this is our heart, our lungs, our skin, uh, well, everything you can see. And he said, but next to that body, we humans possess a mind. We have a race cogitans, something that knows, something that feels. And he said, um, this body is everything that is quantity. So you can measure the brain, you can look at the brain, you can uh, weigh it, you can uh, uh, put, put needles into it, etc., etc., etc. You can measure the brain, but you cannot measure the human mind. That's impossible. He said humans are a connection between these two. The body gives us quantity, gives us weight, the mind gives us quality, gives us the color purple. And somehow these two are connected. Well, this is immediately the big question. How are they connected? And to be honest, Descartes didn't really know. He, he, he had no idea how they were connected. So he came up with a wonderful solution. I think it's a wonderful solution. He said, the race Lovitans, oh, sorry, the race Lovitans and the race Extensa are connected, come together, in the pineal gland. And um, he didn't explain how they come together in the pineal gland. What, uh, the, probably the main reason why he chose the pineal gland of the, of, the, of the spot where they come together was that in his time, the pineal gland was only found in humans and not yet in animals. And since Descartes thought that animals had no race cogitans, this should prove in his vocabulary that the pineal gland was very important for the coming together of the mind and the body. So this was his picture. He solved the color purple problem because he could say, well, the color purple is a quality, so it is in the mind, so we will never find it in the brain. And somehow, um, when the brain uh, works, um, um, the information, or he, he wouldn't have used the word information, but the quality of purple will get connected uh, 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 to our bodily feelings, etc., etc., etc. Well, I think you will agree that this is a terrible solution to it. The nice thing is that nowadays our solutions are just as terrible. Um, what scientists now use is this. They talk about correlations. They say, we don't study the areas of the brain that produce consciousness. We only study areas of the brain that are correlated with consciousness. Well, this is just saying something like blah, 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 pineal gland, blah, blah, blah. This doesn't solve anything. There is even a, a, a whole area uh, uh, connected with the pineal gland problem, and that's called neuropsychology. I hope you don't study neuropsychology. Um, well, no, I hope you study neuropsychology because it will be exciting in the coming 20 years. But what the, the word for neuropsychology somehow seems to suggest that we already solved this problem. Well, we have, we have no idea how to solve this problem. There are, at this moment, and I will bypass all the, the, the historical details uh, uh, about this idea, there are, at this moment, three ways of looking at the brain. 
The first I will call indexical. I will come to the explanation in a minute, in a, in a second. Uh, the, the second I will call functional. And the third I will call relational. The indexical uh, way of looking at the brain is the oldest. The functional way of looking at the brain is some 50 years old. And the re relational is um, very new and not uh, very well uh, worked out yet. <clears throat> So, what does the indexical way of looking at the brain tell us? It says basically this, the brain is the mind or the brain is causally connected to the mind. So, in this view, when you look at the brain, you actually look at the mind. Is this true? Well, I don't know how this can be true, but the idea is, is very elegant. What you can say is, well, we see here, this area is active. This must be pain. We see this area is active. This must be shame. Well, what you're doing at that moment is looking at the brain as if it is the mind. But it isn't. You don't see pain, just as you don't see purple. But still, we talk in this way. And let me be clear, I don't say that this way of talking is wrong. It is just a way we have of talking about the brain. But it is no better than Descartes' idea that, that quality and quantity come together in the pineal gland. It's just a way of talking because we have nothing better. These are some very ancient pictures showing uh, 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 this idea. This is the Middle Ages. And uh, uh, these are apparatuses to take out madness. And you see this works great. Uh, uh, you just take out the, the, uh, the part of the brain that causes madness. Well, it, uh, you shouldn't focus too much on the tongue here and on the, on, on, on the expression there. But uh, this, is, this is just this idea. Somebody is mad, um, take out the part of the brain uh, that is causing the madness, or that is the madness, and you have, um, um, well, you've solved the problem. Phenology is also an indexical way of looking at the brain. It is saying this brain is cut up, or, or is organized into different functional areas, and uh, if you know where to look, you know um, 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 what you will find, what sort of characteristics you will find, what sort of uh, uh, thoughts you will find, and well, it's, it's just the same image. It is indexical. By looking at the brain, you see the mind. And you all know that phrenology has, it, has had its heydays. Great. This is very modern way of doing the same. This is just, well, this, well, when you see this, this looks great, fantastic, absolutely fine, this must be very intelligent work here. And it is. But still it is indexical. To interpret this picture, you have to take an indexical look. What you say is, well, here we have a healthy brain, and here we have an abused brain, and uh, 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 here you can see uh, the healthy parts, and the healthy parts are missing here. So what we are looking at here is an abused brain, or an abused mind. And look at the wording they choose. This, this, is, this is great. This, um, um, uh, the PET scan of the brain of a, a Romanian orphan who's a little not shows effect of extreme deprivation in infancy. Yes, so what this shows, what this gives you, is the signs of deprivation. And that's an indexical look. You look at the brain, and what you see is something about the mind. We'll move on to the functional way of looking at the brain. And this is really very, a very recent way to look at the brain. The function of the brain is to process information. Now well, maybe some of you really believe this. And well, it sounds intelligent. And it is intelligent. Look at the brain as if it is a computer. 
But there's a very difficult term, and that's the term information. We have no idea what this term means. So we talk about information in the brain. We talk about areas sending information. But really, we don't have any idea what information is. I dare you to find a good definition of information. I dare you to find a good a, a, a definition of information in the brain. We don't know what it is. Is it just signals? The term information presupposes somebody to whom it is information. Even Shannon, I don't know if you know Shannon, but he was a, uh, a technician philosopher who wrote a lot about information, said information is only information if somebody receives information. But there's no one in the brain to receive information. There's no homunculus running around in the brain looking for information. That's not possible. So information is just a term to get rid of difficult questions. This is a warning. When you hear neurologists or neuroscientists talk about information, you know one thing. They don't know what to say. And they use the term information to lull you, to, to keep you quiet. And you all think, well, this information, this is computers, this is very, 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 very complex. Well, it isn't. It's just babbling to get something, to get around the, the, the pineal gland. This is David Marr's work on fission. And here you see how people who look functional at the brain work. So David Marr uh, really put up uh, um, uh, a high-level computer program style of, of um, uh, analysis. And he said, well, this is the input image. So we are computers and something is put in. And then from that we come to an edge image, a 2 d sketch and a 3D model. I know this works in gaming very well. And this is the way we design computer games. But is this happening in our brain? And who is looking at these models? The homunculus? Why do we need a 3D model in our brain? So that we can look at it? The same goes for language. Most people who are into language, language processing, take a functional perspective on what they see in the brain. And I think it is wrong. Well, it's not wrong, it's incomplete. It leaves out the difficult question of the pineal gland. This is the picture Daphne gave us, and you already showed us. It's about the retina. It's, so the light comes in from there, and passes through these layers, and goes on. Well, she also provided the text that came along with this picture. And that's very interesting, because here you will see these two types of looking at the brain. Because what are we looking at here? Well, this is the explanation. We are looking at a retina. And the fish, 2008. This image of a chick's retina reveals the three basic stages of visual processing. <coughs> what do we mean? By the circuit in the eye that detects light and transforms it, transforms it into signals the brain can understand. So the brain understands? It understands the information that's coming from the eye? This is just blah, blah, blah. This is just blah, 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 purple clocks up. At the top of the image are the retina's photoreceptors. Well, I would agree with that very much. In gray, the familiar rods and cones that capture photons of light and translate, so this is uh, uh, very nice, them into electrical currents. So it is electrical currents uh, it is signals that the brain can understand, it is transformation, it is processing, etc., 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 etc. The truth about the retina is we don't know a lot about it. We know we can, we can photograph it, we can show the different parts, but this is all speculation. And it is speculation like Descartes would have done. 
So we are still here with this problem. How does the problem curriculum come up? And we should, I think we should be honest. We should tell students we don't know. And what we will give you is nice talks about function, about um, uh, uh, areas, about, but really we don't know. This is a nice example of the, of the, of the same difficulty. Um, you all will have seen this, I think. These are two shades of gray, while in reality there is no difference between the upper and the lower. Yes, you can see that here. So what would it mean? What would, sorry, what would, would this mean in our brains? Our retina receives the same type of light in both cases. It sent it to our brains. And then our brains change it into different shades of gray. So that we're a little bit confused with these kinds of illusions. Why does the brain do that? So, I will come to the third way of looking, the relational way. And uh, this is the way we are working on right now. This is the way that's being developed. And we don't know how it's going to look. So there's the question mark. The brain is only one element of the relation that constitutes mind. So in this view, brain is no longer the place where the mind is. You are not your brain. I will repeat this over and over because this is a very confusing uh, a book title in the bookshops at this moment. Uh, 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 Smart's terrible book. Uh, or, or at least it's got a terrible title. Uh, you are your brain. Well, that's not true. You are not your brain. At least that's a relational way of looking at it. This type of scan, the DTI scan, is popular within uh, uh, circles that study the relational way of looking at things. Um, the DTI scan doesn't show uh, the, the neurons, but it shows the accents and the dendrites, I think, between the neurons. So it shows the pathways. This type of scan takes on a different angle on the brain. It doesn't say the brain is a place where things happens, happen. It says the brain is a place that connects different parts of the human. And really, within the relational perspective, that is all the brain does. It connects different parts of the human. This is another type of DTI scan. And I think these are the most beautiful scans, so the relational way must be right. Must be right. <laughs> these are the best scans. So this is not a place where something happens. This is an organ that connects. And that's the whole idea about the brain within the relational view. It is an organ that connects. So from these scans and from other techniques, you can make what is called connectograms. And what connectograms do is, well, this is an image of the brain. But it is an image of the brain as a connectivity organ. When you move your finger, uh, uh, something else gets dragged along in the way, and you can trace all these dragging alongs, and eventually your body gets dragged along as well, because there is no fundamental, no principle boundary between the brain and the rest of your body. There is even no principle boundary between the, your brain, your body, and the outside world. These all get connected via the brain with the help of your, your, your organs, your arms, your feet, your head, your eyes, your hips, and the outside world. There is no place where the mind resides. So this is, this is the way we are looking at brains at this moment. When you hear scientists talk about brains, they really don't have a clue how to look. So we do use three different types. We use the indexical type, the functional type, and we use, use a little bit of a relational type, because that's being developed right now. But I think Descartes was right. If you read books by neurologists nowadays, they always begin 
with bashing Descartes. But I think fundamentally Descartes was right in some respect. He was right when he said we do strange things to connect mind and brain. Well, that's right. We use the pineal gland, we use correlations, we use all kinds of funny talk to connect mind and brain, but we haven't got a clue how to do it. He was right when he said the mind cannot be localized, the mind cannot be given a place. He was right about that. And he was right about this. We like the pictures, but we don't know what we are looking at. I will finish with a quote from Michael Kazanica, who is a, 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 an eminent neurologist, I might say. He says, to further neurology, we are in desperate need of a new theory that helps us pose the right questions and enables us to appreciate the answers. We need great thinkers to lead the way in brain research. These thinkers don't necessarily have to be neuroscientists. Maybe someone is already incubating a new concept. If that happens, we might expect neurological knowledge to explode. So he is really waiting for new concepts. Because we cannot get around the pineal gland problem. But until we find these new concepts, we don't really know what we are looking at. Thank you very much.